let's say in Mexico, on average, you might have um, four people sharing the same residential IP address, but you might have up to 30 or 40 people, devices, let's not say people, but more like devices, sharing the same mobile carrier IP. And this is simply why it, you're much less likely to get blocked when you're on a mobile IP, simply because if they block you, they might be blocking 50 people right now and a thousand people in the span of several days. So that's why websites very, very rarely block, web, uh, block IPs which are marked as mobile IPs. Hi, this is Stan at Mozulogin. We are here at Affiliate World Barcelona. And here with me, it's George from Proxy Empire. And here we're gonna talk about uh, the different use cases uh, regarding data center, residential and mobile proxy. Mobile proxies, they have a really interesting research to share with us. George, how is it going? Going well, thank you. How are you enjoying the conference? Oh, I love it. It's going great so far. Made a lot of new contacts, met up with some clients of ours and establishing new partnerships. I know that Proxy Empire um, actually creates a service based on research and actually provides proxies that work. And I yes. heard a lot of uh, actual information from users that they're very happy with Proxy Empire. Can you just briefly, very briefly talk about Proxy Empire and what sure it is? Sure thing. Uh, so Proxy Empire is a residential and mobile proxy provider. We're also going to be offering data center proxies because we did sell demand for it. But what we do differently from other proxy providers is we have, first of all, you know, we're a newer provider, so our pricing is a little bit better. Right. And we also have a very flexible billing policy, while other premium proxy providers, they require you to have an active subscription to use the data you already paid for in previous months. We don't do that. It's basically on a pay-as-you-go basis. You can top up and then use it over several months. And we're also quite flexible in terms of payment solutions and so on. And uh, we tend to allow pretty much any use case except uh, accessing you know, financial websites and stuff right. because we want to make sure we're 100% compliant. But for Facebook, Google, Yes, no problem. No problem at all. Uh, so I know that there is the, the best types of proxies to use are residential proxies or, or mobile proxies. Yes. Yeah. Uh, can you just tell me what kind of like what's the difference between mobile and res residential proxies? Like in which cases is it better to use mobile and in which cases it is better to use residential sure. IPs sure. Yeah. proxies? Well, honestly, in pretty much all cases it's better to use mobile proxies because they're much less likely to get you know flagged or blocked simply because the way IPs work you know mobile carriers they they rotate a lot of uh, they rotate IPs between a lot of people so for example while for residential one IP might be used by just one person or one household with mobile it's different because every time you move let's say 100 meters your phone gets connected to a different cell tower and uh, you get another IP which can be used within the same day by 20, 30 different people. So it's a lot less likely you will uh, be viewed as a suspicious uh, visitor and blocked. So if the cost permits, I always recommend that people use mobile proxies. If your project's uh, needs are a bit more cost sensitive, I would recommend using residential IPs. And only for projects where uh, the website you're targeting for scraping or whatever is very, you know, very relaxed uh, about blocking, then you could use data center IPs. But as a minimum, I would recommend using residential proxies. Well, you know, with mobile proxies, they are a little bit more expensive, but you'll experience like hassle-free browsing and scraping. Mm -hmm. And the main reason because why mobile proxies work so good is because um, there's a technology called NAT that yeah. basically, uh, uh, like, because we have a, such a limited amount of IP addresses, exactly, uh, a situation with can happen before. Yeah. with IPv4, right? A uh, situation can happen that right now, when we are sitting here, uh, both my phone and your phone can have the same IP address. Exactly. Possible. Yes, yes, because we're connected to the same cell tower, and the reason for that is because you know originally, when the internet was invented, uh, they came up with IPv4. You know that they had like a certain number of millions, uh, sorry, billions of IPs, which seemed like a lot at the time. But as uh, you know, back in those days, you know, they thought the internet would only be used uh, for servers, then you know, for residential users, then mobile users, then Internet of Things like smart fridges, uh, smart air conditioners. 
and they started running out of IPs. So the biggest portion of IPs, you know, they were allocated for data center or uh, government or military purposes, and then for residential uh, providers. Because 20, 25 years ago, no one even thought there's gonna be mobile internet and mobile phones with internet capabilities. So what ended up happening was there was a certain number of IPs left and you know, that were not announced as a certain type. So they announced them as mobile IPs. And now, for example, let's say in Mexico, on average, you might have uh, four people sharing the same residential IP address, but you might have up to 30 or 40 people, devices, let's not say people, but more like devices, sharing the same mobile carrier IP. And this is simply why it, you're much less likely to get blocked when you're on a mobile IP, simply because if they block you, they might be blocking 50 people right now and a thousand people in the span of several days. So that's why websites very, very rarely block, web, uh, block IPs which are marked as mobile IPs. Let's talk briefly about the research that you made. I know that sure. on your website uh, you published uh, research where on our you... our locations pages. Yes, uh, on your location pages and the link will be in the description below uh, where you uh, basically analyze uh, the distribution of IPs in different geos. Yes. Can briefly yeah. about this and how can this information be applied in selecting uh, what, right. what proxy to yeah. use. Sure, so basically if your use case does not require proxies from a specific country, what I would do is actually go for the countries which have the lower number, lowest number of unique IPs per 1,000 people because this means that they're shared by more people and thus less likely to get blocked. So for example, if you go for Switzerland or US which have several thousand IPs per 1,000 uh, population, you know, they're they're shared less, so it's more likely to get blocked. But if you go, it's for, easier. For it's Mexico easier to block. Yes, it's easier for them to block them. But if you go for a country like Mexico, where IPs are shared more between users, it's much less likely to get blocked. So, okay, let's say you need to use US proxies. So then comes the question: Should you use residential or mobile? You know, as I mentioned earlier, if you really care about costs, go for residential. Right. And only if it's not uh, it's not cost effective, it costs too much, then you can go for data center. But if the cost is okay, but the success rate is not good enough with residential, you should try with mobile. And uh, actually, as as you know, we have a partnership established, and we would be happy to give you know multi-login customers extra bandwidth. 15% as we agreed. Really cool. Multi-login users. Cool. Uh, that's really nice. Uh, you can find more details on our proxy partnership page uh, regarding this deal. Uh, what I also am very interested, can you actually name a couple of countries where the number of uh, unique IPs per thousand uh, users is the lowest? Can you name a couple of them? Yes, yeah, sure. Mexico, Iran, Turkey, uh, Laos, Cambodia. And those are pretty much the, the country, and, and of course, like the small Caribbean islands, because there, there were some islands like uh, Vanuatu, if I'm not mistaken, which had like uh, 20 IPs per 1,000 wow. people. Yes, yes. Uh, why do you think this happened in these countries? What do you think? I mean, if, if you go back to the time when the internet was created, the countries uh, which actively participated in the creation of the technology and were the leading powers back then, they they got the biggest share of the total IPs allocated, like US, UK, Canada, France, uh, Russia got a relatively high number of IPs allocated. Well, countries like Mexico, you know, 30, 40 years ago, they, they were nowhere to be seen on the IT scene. They, I mean, basically, they, they had problems with getting electricity, let alone internet. So <laughs> True. It wasn't a big priority for them. Uh, my final question is, uh, what do you think, what is the future of IPv6? So it's a very complicated issue. We knew that uh, IPv4 is getting depleted even 10 years ago. I remember when I was still doing SEO because that was my first online business. Even back then they were talking, IPv4 is running out. Maybe you should host your private blog networks on IPv6. It will yeah. be okay. Websites will be fine with it, but no, turns out you know, there's uh, IPv6 hosting, there's IPv6 proxy providers, 
but they just uh, don't seem trustworthy because legit consumers to this day over 95 percent of users use ipv4 ips and the moment you access a website like facebook or maybe an app like tinder on an ipv6 ip you're much less uh, more likely to be blocked simply because it just doesn't make sense normal users don't really use ipv6 most of the time and maybe eventually in five ten years maybe it will finally start getting used more but right now they have this you know trillions and trillions of ips but no one is really using them right interesting very interesting although these ipv6 uh, are very unique and they are very distinguishable it's much more easier for websites to block as exactly ipv6 yes. but the main problem is that the usage of ipv6 doesn't it's, it's suspicious by itself it's suspicious by itself because if you block ipv4 in your uh, internet protocol settings and you try to access only with IPv6, some websites, smaller ones, they don't even allow you to visit it without the public facing IPv4 IP on your browser. Interesting, so if we look... And it will be a lot easier to block because yeah. basically every person will have his own unique IP or every device. If you look long term, actually, we can say that proxies are winning the game. Yes, of course. Because it becomes very much more difficult for websites to block a specific user based on IP. And if IPv6 don't get a widespread, then I think we will win the game. Exactly, pretty much. And again, even if IPv6 wins the game still, then you will need proxies even more because now you might be fine with restarting your router or restarting your phone sure. to get a new IP. When sure. IPv6 gets fully implemented, you cannot get a new IP by doing that because they're not rotating, they're pretty much static. That's the whole idea. It's like a digital citizenship, but in the case of your device, a unique IP that never changes. Man, thanks very much. I think this is like very useful information, actually. Uh, when you've told me about the different, different types of, uh, uh, like, about the difference uh, of allocation of IP in different geos, this is the first time I've heard about this. This is really cool. Uh, we'll definitely publish uh, the research in our YouTube, uh, in the description of our YouTube video. But regardless, thanks very much. Thanks for your time as well. Thank you, George.